Greetings folks and welcome to the Electromaker Show. This is your midweek roundup of all things Maker, Embedded and Lovely. There's a bunch of new products this week, including a Doctor Who themed kids development board, which has a RISC-V architecture processor, which is kind of cool. And of course we have the mystery box competition and a plethora of other things to get down to. So let's start the show. We're going to start this week with a new product that's been announced, which is a collaboration between BBC Learning, which I'm sure you're familiar with, it's the learning arm of the BBC, and Tinker, which if you're not familiar with, is a coding website which helps kids learn to code. And this collaboration is in the form of the Doctor Who High Five Inventor Coding Kit. And this is the core of it, this hand-shaped little box here. Now this hand-shaped little box is a little development board, which as you can see has an LED matrix on the front, it has a couple of buttons, and uh, the really interesting thing about it is that it, it, uh, inside it is a Psi 5 RISC 5 chip. Now um, that's kind of cool, as far as I know, this is definitely the first learning device that uh, has a RISC 5 architecture. It might even be the first sort of uh, consumer and not completely DIY side hackers board, um, because the Doctor Who element of this is that the character of the 15th Doctor, Doctor Who, played by Jodie Whittaker, takes you through certain adventures where you have to use the High Five board to solve tasks and hopefully learn something along the way. Now before we go into the board, just quickly, um, Tinker is something that if, you're, uh, if you haven't seen it before, um, they have uh, found an easy way to build critical thinking and coding skills. And it is a, a very nice uh, put together courses for a variety of ages. Uh, let's just see uh, this example, which is for people ages 8 to 13 or so. Um, and it's all in a sort of story. As you can see, there's animated characters. And in each one of these uh, parts of the story, you have to complete certain tasks in order to uh, progress. And each one of these tasks teaches you the basics of coding and logic and robotics and things like that. And as you can see, this is using block code because for the earlier ages, it's easier to do that than try and teach children syntax. Um, it's a very good way of learning and there are lots of sites that do it. Um, Tinker seems to be uh, really kind of one of the larger ones and it is a subscription course. But this is how it all ties together because this kind of learning is the same way that the High Five board is supposed to be working, which is a very nice way of uh, putting hardware into the hands of children and keeping them interested. Because this does look like something that Doctor Who might carry around. So very quickly, the board itself. Um, as you can see here, uh, it has a 150 megahertz RISC-V processor. Um, I'll come back to that in just a second. And then there is a variety of sensors. The sensors on board are a magnetometer and an accelerometer. It has this nice little color LED display. Uh, it has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth built in, um, along with a couple of buttons on the front, one on the back. And there is an edge connector on the bottom too. This is the real draw for it. Um, this is uh, going to be something that anyone who is a fan of Doctor Who, and I know that the new Doctor is especially popular with younger viewers, and I've been a Doctor Who fan for many years. I'm not one of those people that complains about the difference between the old Doctor Who and the new Doctor Who. I feel like it's always been quite pompy, um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I've been a fan throughout. Um, but yeah, there's, there's no doubt that the newer Doctor Whos uh, are definitely more uh, aligned with children maybe than the older ones. Um, and having Jodie Whittaker on board is fantastic. Um, so as you can see here, there's all these different uh, things that you can do. Um, I don't know if these specifically are all to do, uh, all the ones which Jodie Whittaker um, narrates. Um, but yeah, thousands of activities and challenges, lessons narrated by the Doctor herself. Um, and yeah, you have all of these... Uh, all of these things, which again, this fits much the same way as the other ones. This will seem very familiar. This is uh, exactly the same as these other Tinker things we were just looking at. However, um, it's Doctor Who based and it has narration from Jodie Whittaker. It's going to be big. Um, and uh, the much like the other ones, the younger ones use block coding in order to get logical ideas into the heads of younger users. And then as they progress, they can move through for, to use MicroPython, which uh, I still think is probably one of the simplest actual coding ways to get people interested in uh, embedded hardware, because MicroPython does run on an increasingly large amount of different little boards. And uh, yeah, I mean, if I was to try and tell anyone to get into coding, uh, Python would probably be, where, probably be where I told them to begin because it is a very forgiving language. Although I still find white space kind of terrifying. I'm not going to lie, I go kind of old school like that. I like my semicolons and my brackets a lot. So the kit itself has this uh, board inside it, which again, um, we'll come back to briefly in a minute because um, I, I want to find an image of it not in the case so we can have a proper look at it. It also has this little high five speaker here, which is, well, a speaker. 
Um, and then a, a couple of uh, alligator clips for collecting, connecting things. Um, it's a tiny point, but the fact that you connect the speaker to it via alligator clips is a very simple but effective way of showing how, uh, you know, how a circuit works. It sounds simple, but I actually find it quite effective. And then you have a USB cord for programming. Another nice touch here, the USB cord has uh, LEDs wound around it, so it lights up when you're programming the board. Just tiny thing, but I kind of find that cool. And a battery pack here, which I believe just takes regular batteries, like AA batteries. So um, I've jumped over to uh, Amazon, uh, just the page where you buy it, just to get a couple of views of the board itself. Um, so you can see here a little of what I was talking about. Um, there's uh, uh, this, I believe, I don't know if this is the accelerometer or whether that's actually on the back of the board. Um, and then, uh, or maybe this is the light sensor and this is the chip. That seems far more likely, Ian, what are you talking about? Um, I believe this is probably the processor. This is a little light sensor, one of the onboard sensors. And this is a nice chunky edge connector. Now, um, as you can see, um, they have these big chunks here for the main three different GPIOs along with power and ground. Although I believe all of these other little edge connectors open up the other functionality, uh, functionality of the chip. Incidentally, I'm not going to dive too deep into the chip on this. If you are interested in doing so, if you head to sci-fi.com slash documentation and uh, skim down, the chip in this board is the E310-G003. And there is a data sheet and a manual for the chip here if you want to get a really deep view of what the uh, chip is capable of. It's actually a pretty uh, powerful little chip and it's a, a pretty bold choice to put inside a kid's uh, learning tool, but it's kind of also awesome. And something I've said on the show a bunch of times, if you get anything with any chip inside, um, you can take it the normal way or you can take it apart and try and do it completely from bare metal. Um, I featured on the show a couple of different uh, uh, tutorials for bare metal AVR coding, and that means you can take your Arduino Uno that you've done everything that you've done before in the Arduino IDE, or in the case of this, with Tinker and all this kind of stuff, um, and you can then go to the documentation and see how to do it the hard way, or for many people, what would be the normal way. And this will be no different. And here is the Hi5 speaker attached via the crocodile clips to the board. Um, now, the chip, uh, just very briefly, it's uh, clocked at 150 megahertz. It has 64 kilobytes of uh, data RAM, 512 kilobytes of flash storage, um, and it has a 16 kilobyte instruction cache. Uh, and now, it, it has quite a lot of onboard uh, signal processing as well. It has four analog to digital converters, um, I2C, SPI, uh, UART, and uh, GPIO interfaces as well. Um, and of course, it's all programmable via its micro USB port. So this is just your regular development board. Um, but if, even if it was a regular development board, the fact that it's a RISC-V chip makes it interesting and compelling to begin with. But the way that they have put this together and the fact that this is going to be a fully integrated kit branded by Doctor Who, uh, I don't know, I, I feel like this is something a little bit special. Um, and there's been a few releases this year of boards designed uh, to get kids into coding, to get kids into making things. Um, but I wanted to open the show with this one because firstly, it is pretty big news in terms of like maker and DIY stuff. This, uh, in my mind, is probably the biggest thing that's come out this year in terms of teaching kids about stuff. You could argue that the micro bit might have a bigger reach because they're going to end up in schools, but I'd be amazed if these didn't show up in schools all over the country as well. So uh, yes, uh, this is available now. Um, I've said this uh, many times on the show. If you're looking for a Christmas present for someone who doesn't necessarily share your love of all things tiny and microcontrollery yet, and you're looking for something that'll get it into them, this might well be the one for you. Um, I'll leave a link to the Hi5 Inventor page in the description of the video. And when you click buy now, it takes you to the Amazon page I was just on, where it is selling for $74.95, um, which is a currency that I do not understand, but I'm sure it sells for a similar amount of money wherever you're watching this show from. Now, moving on, we're going to talk about Risk OS very briefly. Now, Risk OS is sort of weird to me because I understand what it is. And in fact, it was my first experience with computers. Namely, in this beautiful machine right here. Now, this is an Acorn A3, Acorn Archimedes A3000. Um, when I was very, very young, this was the main computer in our house. Um, for many years, my father, who was a computer enthusiast at first, he, he later moved on to lecturing um, uh, in programming. Um, but uh, as a hobbyist, he would get various computers. We had uh, various BBC computers as well. And then we moved on briefly to Acorn when they were in their heyday. So um, uh, the Acorn Archimedes A3000, and I think there was one other which either predated it or came after it, I can't remember, were the first computers that I had real hands-on experience with. 
So why am I talking about an old computer like that? Well, uh, Acorn Computers ran on RISC OS. This was an operating system designed to work on ARM chips. Now, of course, ARM are still a massive name to this day, um, but back in the day, uh, ARM, based out of Cambridge, uh, were the main chips for uh, Acorn Computers. This was long before they took over the embedded world and all the things that have happened since. Um, and RISC OS was the operating system designed specifically to work on that hardware. But this still doesn't explain why I'm talking about RISC OS. Well, RISC OS hasn't gone away. In fact, there's a group of people really trying to keep it going and to make it an operating system for computer enthusiasts like me, like you probably. And now there are two hardware boards with RISC OS that you can buy as uh, purpose-built computers with the RISC operating system on them. And this is where Cloverleaf comes in. Now, Cloverleaf is a team that are uh, building their own version of RISC OS for uh, single board computers, namely the Rock Pi 4B, I believe is the title of that computer, and the Raspberry Pi 4. Um, now, uh, there's a, a Kickstarter with a very detailed video going through all of this. Um, I suggest you go and watch the video, it's very well made. Um, and the guy who uh, made this version of RISC OS um, has a very detailed talk about his history with it and what they wanted to do with a modern version of RISC OS. Um, but what we're really here for is this. So, uh, this is Cloverleaf. Now, um, as I said, comes in uh, two varieties. Um, there is the Cloverleaf uh, for Raspberry Pi 4 and the Cloverleaf for Rock Pi 64. So the Puma board is the one with the Rock Pi in, and I believe there is one other. Um, there is also a fantastic article on CNX Software about this. Um, so the Cloverleaf Puma powered by Rock Pi 4B, Cloverleaf Kitten featuring a Raspberry Pi 4 board. Um, and yes, as you can see here, this is a nice mini computer. It even has a DVD drive in it, something that I haven't had in any of my computers for many years. Um, and the uh, operating system itself is, uh, they're trying to update it to a point where it sort of works in a uh, kind of modern way. Um, I do know that one of the plans for the browser is that they want to get JavaScript and HTML working. And yeah, as you can see here, this is, uh, this is a very nostalgic kind of image to me. I'm sure this doesn't look exactly like the old RISC OS does, but it kind of reminds me a little bit of it. And I'm already, after years and years of not using a computer, I'm already kind of over here um, pressing my middle mouse button because that's how you open context menus on RISC OS. Um, now, um, I understand that this is potentially a little bit niche for some people. Um, if you didn't start life using RISC OS, um, you might not really understand the hype of it. Um, I know even back in the day, there was a little bit of a sort of turf war going on between Mac users and Acorn users and all that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, this is something that I find very compelling and um, Oh, uh, lemmings, <laughs> sorry, distraction, lemmings. Um, and uh, the computers themselves do seem like they are very nicely built things. This doesn't seem like a project that is out to make a massive profit. Um, th that said, uh, 299 euros for what is uh, essentially a you know, a single board computer with a few peripherals might seem a bit high for some people, but if you have the passion, then that's a small price to pay, given that a mint condition older computer with RISC OS can set you back a lot more than that these days. Um, so if this is something that might interest you, if you're interested in RISC OS at all, then maybe have a quick look at the Kickstarter. Um, there is a lot of information on here um, and various people involved with the project are talking about how it works. Um, and uh, yeah, this is, a, this is kind of quite a nice little touch here, by the way. Um, just a residual VM is also available, so you can play games like Grim Fandango and uh, Escape from Monkey Island and uh, Myst 3 Exile. Um, I'm kind of hyped that they mentioned these two, because again, uh, favorite games of mine in the past. Um, and yeah, there's, there's a lot to unpack here and I do not have time to do it on this show, but um, it's very rare that I read through something and it just makes me happy the fact that it even exists and this is one of those things. So the Kickstarter page here is full of all of the information that you will need and um, as always, the fantastic CNX software has a full rundown of it too. Um, I will leave a link to the CNX software article in the description of the video because the Kickstarter campaign is linked in the very second paragraph right here. Moving on, Asus have revealed two new Tinkerboards. They are the Tinkerboard 2 and the Tinkerboard 2S. Now, there's not a lot of information about them at the minute. There's uh, this image here that you can see, um, which uh, it looks like a single board computer. Um, and uh, the article on Notebook Check, um, which is one of the few I could find in English, uh, uh, gives you a few specs here. Um, now, uh, the specs themselves are kind of in keeping with the new generation of single board computers. Uh, they both use the Rock chip RK3399, uh, which has two ARM Cortex A72 cores and four ARM Cortex A53 uh, cores along with a Mali uh, GPU. Now, um, 
It's interesting that this is being reported the way it is because I, I found uh, this article in English, uh, maybe one or two others in English, and several in different languages, but there's nothing from ASUS yet. ASUS themselves haven't actually said anything. Um, and it all seems like um, this it all stems from this one article by uh, Klubik, uh, on Klubik, sorry, by Nurses, um, and uh, it's in French, as you can see, um, and uh, it's somewhere in here um, he quotes the fact that there was a press release from ASUS, which again, I also could not find. Um, but uh, so there's no uh, cost uh, here yet, um, and there's no actual full uh, idea about what these things will do, but they do look kind of uh, compelling nonetheless. Now, the original Tinkerboard um, was c kind of, a legitimate competitor because it was of a similar price and at the time if I remember correctly it had a slightly better support for Android I think um, and this is one of the things that it's saying um, uh, Android 10 will be coming in the beginning of 2021 and uh, native Android 10 is something that I talked about in last week's show it's something that's quite a big deal for some people um, I personally am probably always going to use Linux on single board computers I'm more comfortable with Linux than Android I have no real reason to make Android apps as such although maybe one day that will change. Um, so when there is more information on this, we will definitely come back to it um, because, uh, yeah, Asus being involved in single board computers is something that I find kind of uh, interesting. Um, I always think of Asus as the big computer and especially those gaming Republic of Gamers company. And the fact that they're still finding time to make things like this is kind of interesting to me. It's always impossible for me to tell while I'm filming these things as to how much noise you can hear from elsewhere. Um, but someone has uh, started uh, carving their life story into trees using a chainsaw outside. Um, and this being uh, Germany, um, they probably will not stop for seven or eight hours without food or water or any kind of rest. Um, so I do apologize if there is uh, any background noise in the show today, not much I can do about it. Then again, maybe you can't hear it at all and I just seem mad. <laughs> So you may have noticed the jumper, uh, yes, it's very cold in the Attic of Dreams, and Mr. Heater has done his best, but he can't be on during the show because he's too loud. So I have a loose leaf tea, uh, which is keeping me going, and I thought it might be the perfect time to move on to funding website things. Although I am aware that the last section had a lot of things on funding websites in it as well, but that's, that's okay, the, the, the difference, maybe. So we're beginning back at Kickstarter again with the Loco Mo Go train, which is learning coding through play. Now, we've had a few things to do with learning, uh, uh, teaching kids how to code on this show already, but this one is a little bit different. This is a purely hardware device, and one, as you can see from the image, looks everything like an old wooden train toy, but has a few nice features built into it. So they have a rather flashy uh, video uh, for their launch, um, but the basic idea behind this is that you have this train, um, and the train itself doesn't expose any um, kind of software side of things to begin with. It looks just like a toy train. Um, and in the very beginning stages, uh, you can just put tape around the floor instead of a track, and it will follow the track. Now, I'm sure you can see where this is going. Um, right now, no child needs to understand exactly what is going on, but as time goes on, there are more and more things you can add to it. So you put other ca kinds of tape down, and that tape makes the uh, uh, car light up. Um, and skipping on a little bit um, so we don't have to watch through all of it, um, you can then start to control it from an app. You can then uh, start to put different kinds of tape down which has different effects. One of the tape, I think, is a branching tape, so it takes branching tracks. And the idea is, much like these other boards, um, it takes you through different levels of learning through your childhood so you have an idea of code. Now, their video does have a very happy and cheesy ending where the little girl that you just saw ends up working in a high-flying coding job. Um, nobody can promise that that will happen, but it is a very nice thought nonetheless. So the Kickstarter page goes into a bit more detail as to the things I was just talking about before. You have the locomotive itself, which uh, it will follow tape or lines drawn on paper, um, and then you can start adding things to it. Um, the colour car is, again, a nice touch. No coding whatsoever. You just have the colour car, and then you put the tape down when you want the colour car to light up. Nice and simple. When this, if, if this train goes over the tape, then the colour car lights up. You're already getting some logic in there. And here you can see, it shows you this idea and how that works. And then you have the connectivity car, and this is what connects to a phone or tablet and the app, which allows you to start doing the very basic, earliest uh, visual block coding. And it continues on and on. So this is something that appeals to me, probably because I have a young child, and uh, this is stuff that's sort of on my mind. Um, uh, but also just because aesthetically, it's a very pleasing thing. Um, I have always been compelled with the idea of doing something like this. And um, in fact, uh, like, like many of my projects that never actually get off the ground due to time constraints, one of the things that I was wanting to work on for a while was logic blocks. Um, just simple wooden blocks, each with RFID tags in them. And when you put them in the right order, uh, you get different things. Uh, this seems like a far more compelling way 
way to do it, a lot of a simpler way to do it in many ways. But simple isn't bad. I've said this many, many times. To have a very good simple idea is much harder to have a very complicated idea that doesn't come across very well. So this Kickstarter is actually long gone. Um, now they have an Indiegogo page. Um, I don't really understand funding. I don't know how this works. Um, but, uh, but yes, you can order it actually via Indiegogo now. Uh, you can get the pre-orders out. Um, and uh, the general uh, cost of it is quite high, but these are very premium things. Um, so yeah, the train is 99 uh, euros, and if you get the whole thing, that's 249 euros. Um, but I get the impression that this is supposed to be something that is uh, kept and loved for many, many years. I have no idea how robust these things are, um, but uh, I feel like this is sort of your premium end of uh, smart kids for toys. Uh, so what? Smart kids for toys? <laughs> smart toys for kids. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, something I've kind of learned in recent years is that uh, this kind of price tag, which might seem quite a lot at the time, uh, can pay dividends if it's something that your child actually likes and uses on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, there are some things which at the time I thought like, are we really going to get this for, for, for our child? And he's used it every single day and loves it dearly, worth every penny. Um, so, if you are interested in this, head to the Kickstarter, head to the Indiegogo. As with all things on funding websites, you have to be aware of the fact that uh, there's sometimes these things don't come through the way that you want them to. I am aware that there has been some delays with this project, although um, having read through the updates, um, which are uh, this, this personal update from the co-founder, um, it goes through talking about what's happened in the last few months. It talks about the fact that they had some supplier problems um, and uh, you can make of this what you will. Um, I would like to give them the benefit of the doubt, um, but uh, regardless of uh, when this actually happens, I always like to think of these projects as uh, they're going to come maybe six months later, always. Um, this might be not this year's Christmas present for someone, but I don't know, maybe next year's, who knows. So I'll leave a link to this Kickstarter in the description of the video. Um, even if it is something that you're priced out of or don't have a child or don't have any reason for getting, um, it's definitely worth a read through. They've got a very nice approach to this. And if you are someone who is interested in maybe uh, combining your knowledge of embedded hardware with things that uh, could work with children, which is obviously something that I am uh, very preoccupied with at the minute, it's a good thing to read through. It is a very interesting project. So from aesthetically pleasing teaching aids through to something very hardware focused and day to day and something that all of us have probably faced at some point. That is, what happens when the power goes out and you're using your Raspberry Pi? If you're reading and writing from the SD card, there is a chance that it might corrupt it and then whatever is on that SD card is lost. It's something that's probably happened to all of us at least once. Now the Pi Z Supercap on Kickstarter is there to try and stop this from happening. And uh, yeah, the clue is in the name. It is a hat with a supercapacitor on it designed to work with the Pi Zero. Now, the basic idea here is quite simple. While the Pi Zero is running, the supercapacitor charges. If there is a outage of power, then the supercapacitor takes over and it gives you about 15 to 20 seconds of playtime before the power absolutely runs out. Now, as you can see, the video for this Kickstarter is quite simple. I believe it is a one-man project, but it doesn't take away from the fact that it's actually quite a clever idea. Um, I've come across something similar in the past where I used an Arduino to detect if there was a, a power out or a brown out on the Raspberry Pi and then trigger a reset call to one of the reset pins. Um, but this uh, seems to be a very sweet little idea for grabbing that little bit of extra time you need during a power out to gracefully shut down the Pi, which of course you could do via a script. Um, and that is what the video is going through right now. It's going through sensing whether the USB power has dropped on the uh, Raspberry Pi. And as soon as it senses it, it will uh, stop what the Pi is doing and give it a graceful shutdown so you don't foul up your SD card. So the Kickstarter also provides the schematic for the uh, Pi Z Supercap, uh, and it also gives you the code for uh, shutting things down automatically. Um, and uh, it's it's quite nice. I, I, like the, I like these Kickstarters, which are both products and tutorials all in one. Um, this is one of the ones where uh, it, it, you could completely build one of these yourself if you wanted to, but I would pay for one of these uh, simply because this seems like a very nice idea that is being shared in an open source and very free way. And yet they're only asking for $15 for one of these things. And $15 for all of the parts, putting it together and getting it out to you is, uh, is, is kind of amazing, really. Um, I, I'm a very, very big fan of these smaller scale projects where someone's just had a nice idea and decided to build it. So um, if you are interested in the Pi Z Supercap, um, I will leave a link to this Kickstarter in the description of the video. Um, and uh, yeah, um, if you are interested in supporting smaller makers on Kickstarter, this would be a great place to start, especially if you have a Raspberry Pi Zero that you use frequently. Moving over to CrowdSupply and a new board with the new ESP32S2 chip. 
So yes, the new ESP32 S2 chip uh, came out earlier this year, and it's supposed to be somewhere between the ESP8266 and the normal ESP32 chips. The chipsets themselves are a little bit cheaper than normal ESP32s, but one thing that was missing uh, on release, and since then really, is a plethora of ESP32 S2 development boards, and the Morph ESP240 looks to correct this. Now, their uh, crowd supply video is uh, Kind of hilarious, uh, they're sort of leaning on the pandemic here just a little bit. Um, but, but yes, uh, the idea here is that this is a easy to use development board with a few nice features. And a full 40 seconds into the video, we get to see the board itself. So you can see here, this is your uh, sort of average looking development board, but with one nice uh, difference. And that is we have this high resolution IPS to color display here. So zooming down just a little bit, you have this image of the board right here. Um, and it obviously has all of the uh, GPIO pins exposed on the side as headers. It has a regulator on board for uh, powering via USB. It can also be programmed via USB, which is a nice step up because the ESP32 uh, didn't have a USB out of the box, if I remember correctly. Um, I need to look that up to be absolutely certain. Um, and then uh, you have a battery connector and charging circuit on here too. But this main draw is this IPS display at the top right here. Here. Having an IPS display built into the board is a very nice idea. This isn't the first board that's done it, but it's certainly the first ESP32 S2 board that has done it too. So as it says here, their target was minimalism with room to grow. And apart from the screen, this is a very minimalist regular development board uh, for the ESP32 S2. So just a quick reminder, it has a 240 megahertz single core microcontroller, 128 kilobytes of ROM, 320 kilobytes of SRAM and uh, connect connectivity for Wi-Fi. Now, what it doesn't have, uh, one of the bugbears of the ESP32 S2 is any Bluetooth connectivity or Ethernet connectivity. Uh, if that's going to be an issue for you, then uh, you might want to just get the regular ESP32, of which there are many development boards available. Um, but this is, uh, yeah, this is seemingly a very kind of nicely thought out in the middle board because it isn't so tiny that it just exposes the ship, a chip and a few pins. Um, it has this uh, screen on already, which for any kind of Internet of Things stuff is useful. You're going to want some feedback from your sensors before uh, uh, for debugging and for just generally glancing at it. Um, and uh, yes, uh, as with many boards these days, you can use it with both Arduino and CircuitPython, if you are familiar with either of those, which I'm sure you are familiar with one of them. Um, and, uh, uh, and as I always say, you don't have to do that. You can just uh, program this however you want. Um, Espressive have a fairly decent documentation at this stage. Um, I've, at the minute, uh, I've, with my ongoing fascination in the small time I have for getting down to the bare bones of things, I have been uh, programming ESP8266s uh, uh, from kind of the very bottom level using CN Law's fantastic library, something we'll come back to in weeks to come. Just before moving on, there are a number of stretch goals like this development shield and an enclosure. Um, and of course, they have all of their support and documentation on GitHub if you would like to take a look at that as well. And staying with crowd supply, we have the hackboard. Now, as you can see from this page, it is pre-launch. Um, but this is the first powerful and affordable Windows 10 Pro SBC with optional 4G or 5G connectivity. Uh, there's a lot of qualifiers in that sentence. Um, if you were to say this is the first powerful Windows 10 Pro SBC, uh, that's not true. There's been several x86 SBCs out there which can run Windows 10 Pro. If you were to say it's the first affordable Windows 10 Pro SBC, it would have to be very affordable for that to be true. Now, is it the first powerful and affordable Windows 10 Pro SBC with optional 4G or 5G connectivity? Maybe? Uh, regardless of the title, it's always nice to see new boards that work with x86 architecture. Um, and this has an Intel Celeron chip on board. Um, and uh, as you can see from uh, the GPIO headers here, I always think of these as a good size reference. You're looking at something that's going to be maybe, I don't know, uh, a Raspberry Pi would fit in here. So it's going to be just shy of twice as long and just shy of twice as wide as a Raspberry Pi. So there's not a huge amount of information about this one as yet. Like I say, the qualifiers are all in the title. The specifications are kind of okay for a, a computer like this. There are ones out there that can already match it. Um, the M2 slot for additional uh, storage is nice. Um, and uh, the rest of the specs on here are nothing necessarily to write home about. Now, the optional 4G or 5G connectivity is something I find somewhat compelling. I don't really know how that's going to fit together as yet. Um, but uh, this is something that is, that's it. There's nothing, nothing more to see here. Um, so I will come back to this one when it launches. The main thing that is going to be the most interesting about this one, I think, is probably the price. If this is very low priced, 
um, then it's going to come up into the area of boards like say the Atomic Pi which was never actually designed for release um, that was an old control board from a robot that was sold off when the company went bust and repurposed for the consumer market whereas this looks like it has been designed specifically for the consumer market from the beginning so I'll leave a link to this in the description not much to look at just yet but if you want to sign up to find out more about it you can however I will definitely come back to this one on the show this is a mystery box inside the mystery box there are mystery prizes I put my hand in the mystery box and I pull out a mystery prize yes this is the mystery box competition if you are not familiar that mystery box has prizes in it I give one of them away each week and this week the prize is an unspecified white box what are you what what are you so this is a, an AVR board, I can tell, because it has microchip AVR written on the back, and it has a coin cell battery on the front. Um, secure AVR BLE IoT node. Bluetooth Low Energy Internet of Things, huh? Wow. Oh, this thing's, this thing's really sweet, it's tiny. So um, yeah, I mean, if the clue wasn't already in the name BLE, uh, this is a tiny little Bluetooth low, energy, uh, Bluetooth low energy chip. It has an AVR microcontroller on it, which is an ATtiny1617, along with an ATCC508A. I'm not actually sure what that one is, but this is clearly a tiny little development board for making Bluetooth low energy devices, which is designed to run off a coin cell. Now I notice here it has a little jumper, so you can run it from USB power or the coin cell power, and it has a tiny tiny set of headers here which I presume are for debugging um, yeah this is a lovely little device now I'm as, as I've mentioned a few times on the show I've been messing around with a uh, AVR microcontrollers uh, just to kind of get my head around how to program them outside of the Arduino IDE so I'm almost certain that this will be uh, something that you can use Atmel Studio with or um, if you are like me and a masochist you could always just use AVR dude and do it all from the command line but yes, as always, we have a mystery box prize to give away, but the prize winner remains a mystery. Let's find out who it is. And the winner of the mystery box competition this week is Para Idol, or Pear Idol, I don't know if I pronounced that right either time, um, who made a fantastic suggestion on last week's video that we start using those chapter features on YouTube, something that it hadn't even occurred to me to, uh, to, to do. Uh, for someone who makes a YouTube show, I know remarkably little about how YouTube works. Um, but yeah, that's a fantastic idea. Um, I do understand that not, not everyone has the full between 20 minutes and 40 minutes that this show runs and you might want to skip to the things that you want to see the most and we will start putting that chapter feature in each week's show going forward but yes this lovely little board it will be on its way to you we just uh, will be in touch with you to find out your address um, if you are familiar with AVR microcontrollers then you'll probably be quite at home um, if you receive this and you have no idea where to start maybe just uh, drop us a line and I can point you in the direction of the things that I have been looking at However, if you go back a few weeks on this very show, you will find the fantastic Bare Metal MCU series by Mitchell Davis, who uh, uh, starts with Arduino and ends up with an AT Tiny 85, which is a slightly different chip, of course, to the 1617, but it will give you some ideas of where you can start. And of course, Microchip have a fantastic uh, documentation, so you can also look there. But anyway, this has been this week's Mystery Box competition. Uh, congratulations to our winner. For now, let's get on with the rest of the show. So this week's show has been a bit of a contrast to last week's show in that last week's show was full of projects mostly with a few things on funding websites and products whereas this week has been mostly things on funding websites and products but we do have a few projects from this week that I would like to show you. And we're starting with DIY Perks, who we have had on this show before. He's the guy that made the 4K projector out of pretty much just cheap parts that you could get. It, it was astonishing and it worked very, very well. His channel is a treasure trove of making something out of old stuff. Uh, some of his uh, things about what you can do with old laptops are legitimately useful videos. There are a lot of videos out, th out there about what you can do with old laptops, and a lot of them are fairly generic. He comes up with some very inventive things, but this is a beautiful idea. This is artificial sunlight. Now, as you can see, um, this is a light. I mean, I, I'm sure you guessed that from the thing, uh, the idea of it being artificial. But there's a lot more to it than it just being a panel light. This isn't just an old laptop screen that is uh, firing out white light. As you can see, uh, the light rays are straight as they would be uh, if they were coming from the sun. And he goes into great details as to how he has achieved this. Now, in short, he took an old satellite dish and covered it in uh, reflective vinyl material and then uh, put an LED in the um, collection point of the uh, satellite dish in order to shine the light into it so that it would all shine out uniformly. Now, that's only one part of it, though, because then you have a reflective light that reflects outwards. And yes, all the light is reflected into one spot, but it doesn't have the correct color. 
And just briefly, I should point out, um, he also shows how to do a simpler version using a smaller uh, dish like this, and also a version that doesn't require a satellite dish at all. Um, obviously, some of the piece, parts that he, uh, uh, he uh, is using are, are not particularly easy, especially if you live in a small flat. You don't want to be carting massive satellite dishes around. He, at the end of the video, he goes into a way that you can build this uh, using just a Fresnel lens, the same kind that he used in his projector, in order to push all of the light in the correct direction. Now the build is pretty wild actually. He liquid cools his LED because the LED he uses for the big one is a huge, I believe 500 watt LED. Um, and so yeah, he, uh, he liquid cools it, which is one of the coolest uses of liquid cooling I've seen. We had a, a Raspberry Pi that was liquid cooled in last week's show and now we have an LED. Um, yeah, I, I, I really like this idea of uh, liquid cooling everything. I'm sure at some point uh, I'll find a liquid cooled Arduino and think why, why, why would you do that? There's, there's literally no need. However, this is a very legitimate use case for liquid cooling because it allows him to pump cooling into the LED itself uh, without having too much actually hanging on the uh, dish itself as well because this thing is going to be hanging off a satellite dish as previously mentioned. So yes, long story short, uh, DIY Perks has done it again. This is a, a absolutely wild project. Um, his videos are uh, just fascinating to watch with the amount of effort he puts into them. Um, it's a channel that, uh, as I've said, probably does not need any help from, uh, from us. He's already got a, a two and a half million subscribers. But if you're not someone who's already subscribed to him, uh, I suggest checking this video out. Now moving on to something which is very exciting. Um, we've talked about the blue pill on the show before, the STM32 little development boards. I've got a bunch of them over there. Um, now, STM32 chips are very powerful, very fast, they're ubiquitous, there's more kinds of STM32 uh, chips than I, I could possibly name, um, and they all can do different things. But the blue pill chips themselves uh, are capable of doing a surprising amount, and uh, this is a fantastic uh, idea. This is making it into a nerdy Swiss army knife. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, a Swiss Army knife can do various different tasks. Uh, in the physical world, that might be knives and bottle openers and data, things like that. In the electronics world, what are the things that you need the most when you're working with embedded hardware? Well, a good, log uh, good logic analyzer is one of them, but good logic analyzers are very expensive. Same with oscilloscopes. All of this kind of stuff that you would need is being emulated using an STM32 blue pill board and it has a lot of different functionality. Now this uh, Hackaday article just kind of introduces the idea. It's certainly worth reading um, as it gives a very uh, nice overview as to all the things that you can do with it. Um, but the GitHub is where all of the good stuff is. So Buck50, this is open source firmware that turns a blue pill STM32 F103 dev board uh, into a multi-purpose testing and measurement instrument. So yeah, an eight channel uh, six plus megahertz logic analyzer, which is going to be good enough for a lot of things. Um, if you're someone who's uh, ever needed to use a logic analyzer before, um, it, they can be very yeah, expensive to get ones that actually work up to a decent rate. Um, I've never used a good logic analyzer. I've never had the reason to buy one. Um, and realistically, the times that I would ever need to use a logic analyzer are slim. I'm a hobbyist, I'm a maker. Um, most of the things I use are documented well or have things that just you know work out of the box very nicely. Don't have to worry about it. But um, they are essential when you get a little bit more into the nitty gritty of things and want to work out if things are working properly if the timing that you set up works with the timing of peripherals, lots of reasons. So yes, uh, approximately a 5k sample buffer depth uh, and sample stored on your signal edges for efficient memory usage. That's a good idea, actually. That's a really cool idea. Um, uh, so yeah, sorry, moving on. Uh, live monitoring and logging of digital analog uh, USART, SPI and I2C data. Uh, simple dual channel 1 megahertz digital storage oscilloscope uh, with approximately a 5k sample buffer depth. Uh, and a digital pulse train generator. Uh, I mean, you get the idea. This is a bunch of really useful stuff that, um, that if you don't already own this kind of stuff and you're getting into it and you're trying to do it, you know, on, a, on an absolute shoestring budget, I mean, you really can do things like this on a shoestring budget these days. These blue pill boards are about $1. Uh, and, the, you know, if you just bought a few of them, uh, then you could have one which was actually for working on things and one which is your analyzer for working on things. You could just get a, a whole brace of uh, little Atmel 80 tiny or uh, uh, 80 uh, mega 382p. Did I get that right? 328p. I'm almost getting good. I'm almost getting good. You get a bunch of those and then one of these for all of your signal measurement. It's just a very, very cool idea. 
Now, um, I found this quite late uh, in this week's uh, setup for the show. I didn't actually see it in time to try it myself. Um, but this is one of the ones that I would at least have enough time to try flashing the firmware and having a little fiddle around with. Um, and so maybe if I do get that done at some point in the next week or two, um, we can revisit this and see how useful it actually is and whether it's something that we should look into a little bit more. So I will link to the Hackaday article about this. And uh, one thing I forgot to mention, by the way, is that uh, there is a Python app which gives a text-based UI for configuring and using the device. Um, that's, yeah, that's a very nice touch as well. Um, I, I have said this so many times on this episode alone. I know I say it way too often, but this is a really cool project. I'm really, really pleased that it exists. It's something I hope to dive into at some point, and I hope you do too. And we're going to round off this week's show by talking about a couple of videos from a couple of YouTube channels that I have been wanting to feature on the show for some time, but just have needed to find the right opportunity to do so. The first of which is Phil's Lab. Now, Phil's Lab is a YouTube channel which specializes in hardware design, but it's a little bit different to many of the other ones. Um, so there are some tutorials for creating firmware, for example, for the STM32. Uh, this is one on free RTOS as well. Um, but his most recent video covers something that he's put on the channel several times before, which is designing hardware around STM32 chips. Now, this one is an especially good introduction to the channel because it is a 20 minute overview of how you can make um, a uh, STM32 development board of your own. So uh, the idea, skipping through very quickly, would be uh, this is the design and you have uh, the STM32 chip here along with the, the uh, crystal oscillator for timing and everything else you need exposing the GPIO pins. And he is teaching you how to select a chip, put it on a board, put it in KiCad and then order it on JLC PCB, who are the ubiquitous uh, circuit people these days. It seems like everyone who is getting PCBs is getting them from JLC these days. Um, and I absolutely understand why. They do good work for very, very cheap. And I get to say that without worrying because I'm one of the few people on the internet who's not sponsored by JLC PCB, it seems. But yes, even if I wanted to try and talk this through all the way, I couldn't. It's too much uh, information and it's amazing he's managed to condense it down into 20 minutes without it feeling too dense. Um, it shows you uh, every single step of how you would want to design a board, the considerations you should uh, uh, p uh, bring into mind, and how all of the parts fit together. Um, he covers the how you can uh, look at how the pins work using the STM Cube IDE, or the STM32 Cube IDE, sorry. Um, and yeah, this is just every single step, explaining why they are there, how they are placed, and then how to place them all on a PCB using the free KiCad software. Now this is by far the first time that Phil has put out a video like this. Um, so uh, for example, here is a, a design for an uh, STM32 with uh, some RF receiver on it and uh, USB. And again, this is a similar kind of video. This goes through everything that you would need to consider before creating your design and then how you can create the design using the KiCad software. And I believe I have clicked on an advertisement there. So um, yes. Phil's Lab, fantastic YouTube channel, fantastic resource. It doesn't just go through this kind of stuff, although to me this is the most compelling stuff in his channel. He does also have some fantastic general explanation videos of various concepts. If you're not already subscribed to him, I would suggest uh, going to his channel, but I will leave a link to this specific video in the description of the video that you are watching right now. And finally this week, yet another YouTube channel I have been really wanting to feature on our show for some time, and that is Javid X9. Now, Javid X9, who also goes under the name One Lone Coder, um, has been putting out incredibly high quality tutorial videos on uh, C++ and game development in general for a very long time. He is the author of the Pixel game engine and the console game engine, which are both very bare bones, but also very well put together um, game engines. Um, I'm a big fan of the Pixel game engine because essentially all it does is <coughs> it gives you a library which allows you to draw to the screen. Um, and that's about all it does. It has a lot of convenience functions for vectors. It has a, a lot of convenience functions for colors and things like that. But um, this isn't like Unity. Um, if you want to work out how to move from point A to point B, you need to do the mathematics yourself. You need to work it out. It is the perfect educational tool, tool for programming. And alongside it, Javid puts out regular videos, which are just astonishing, uh, really well, really well put together um, and really easy to understand. And I have learned probably more uh, about coding, especially coding in C++ from Javid than I have from anyone else over the years. Alas, making a fantastic game engine and programming tutorials is not enough for me to put it on this show specifically, as we are supposed to be sticking in the embedded world, at least somewhat. I know I come out of it a little bit. But luckily, Javid recently put out a video on how to control an Elegoo robot smart car. 
Now, the Elegoo Robot Smart Car kits are uh, fairly simple little things. Um, I've got one up on the shelf over there. Um, they're Arduino powered. Um, they're uh, quite functional, nice little robot cars, really. They're all cheap parts, but they all work very well together. And Elegoo have both um, a quite nice little way of putting it together educationally, um, and it works with uh, Bluetooth, and it also works with infrared, if I remember correctly, the one I have. Um, I, I bought this with my own money. But this has nothing to do with Elegoo. Um, now, Javid, um, who did get his car sent from Elegoo, he makes very certain to say that, um, because he's a good man, uh, is a very interesting person to do this, because he does his coding uh, tutorials on his channel, but that's his hobby. His full-time job is in robotics. He is a hardware uh, robotics um, programmer. That's his day job. Um, and so seeing him take one of these and hack it a little bit is kind of interesting, because he's still trying to do it from a very low-level beginner perspective. So the video speeds through the building of the car and just goes into uh, exactly how it works. So here there's the little infrared controller he's showing off right now. And then I think a little bit later he shows it working with the Android app. Oh no, it's still using the infrared controller. Okay, interesting. Anyway, regardless of the ways it is meant to be controlled, the whole point of this video is showing you how you can hack into this and make it do your own thing from your own code. So here he is looking at the Arduino code, looking at how it reacts to commands sent via Bluetooth or via infrared. Um, and then moves on to coding in uh, C++ on his computer using a uh, Bluetooth dongle from the computer and using his own Pixel Game Engine to make a front-end GUI to control the car. Now, this is part of a series he's been doing on ACIO. Now, if you're a music -y person like me, you hear that, you probably think of uh, ACIO, the music thing. It's not that. It's a different library. It's asynchronous input-output. So this is part of a larger series on ASIO. Um, I may have said ACIO before, it's ASIO. Um, and uh, this is uh, using ASIO to send signals to the robot. Anyway, needless to say, he uses the uh, Pixel Game Engine as the front end, and these are the buttons that you can press. Um, and then he is connecting to the robot car here. Um, and as you are about to see, hopefully he is controlling the robot car using his computer. So as you can see here, in the top right of the screen is his computer, and uh, down here is the robot car. Now, um, he had to use a different Bluetooth dongle, um, but as you can see when he's clicking on the uh, uh, screen on his computer, he is now controlling the robot car. And um, I feel like this is something that uh, is that nice step between, as I talk about a lot, there's, you can program completely program your own stack uh, to try and control a robot, build a robot from scratch. That's a great project, but it's a little bit heavy. And then you can get these uh, pre-built kits, which have uh, Arduino code, and you can do it that way. And you can completely reprogram it that way. This sits somewhere nicely in between and shows you how you can use libraries and use different things to link stuff together. Now, if I sound like I'm being over, overly enthusiastic, it's because I am. As I've said before, this is one of my favorite YouTube channels. Um, I've been uh, watching Javid for some years. I've watched every one of his videos. You could call me a bit of a fan, I guess. Um, but uh, this one especially appealed to me because it fits, uh, fits my interests. I like building nice little robot-y things. Um, and it links uh, one side of my uh, uh, kind of passion, which is for just generally getting better at programming as a whole, to the other, which is hacking away at little robots and maker things. Anyway, as I said, the One Lone Coder channel, or Javid X9, um, is a treasure trove for people who are interested in coding, interested in game design, interested in music synthesis. He has a, a, a short series on making your own synthesizer in C++, uh, purely on computers. Um, and uh, there are a couple of videos where he has uh, done things with robotics. Um, he also built a robot arm some time ago and got his Twitch chat to control it. Um, uh, and his Twitch trap managed to almost stab him with a screwdriver, which was hilarious. Um, so yes, uh, I would suggest going to this channel if you haven't seen it before. Uh, it is one of my favorites. And uh, uh, this controlling the Elegoo ro uh, smart robot thing turned out to be quite simple. And it makes me wonder whether uh, something a little bit more uh, fun could be done with it in the future. Um, it's certainly one of the things that if I do get any time off over Christmas, I'll be making sure I have a little robot kit with me because I have a double reason to play with it. Now I get to play with it and little robot kits running around the floor will probably be quite entertaining for the little lad as well. That was our show for this week. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, the Electron Mega Show is a weekly, so I'll be here again next week. But in the meantime, uh, feel free to drop into the comment section and let me know what you're up to. Also, if there's something on the show you particularly liked, or maybe something you thought I didn't cover all that well, do let me know. I do like to know when I've made mistakes here and there. Um, and of course, every comment we have gets entered into the Mystery Box competition. But anyway, for now, I hope you have a creative and a safe week, and I will see you next time.